uh, yeah, so Brainard's background in, you know, having a PhD in, uh, in studying Hinduism and how it relates to Christianity and so on, I think would, uh, thought would be a great help for us at this point of time, particularly in the Colson Fellows, the first three months is focused on worldviews, right? And, uh, and so it's dealt with in the stuff, but very, you know, sort of in a very sort of light way. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Brainard, over to you. Thanks. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, hello, Daniel. Good to see you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm sure. Daniel is... Uh, hi, hi, Renard. I, I'm there. Only I'm in the PP. This is how I look now. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> yeah. So this is, uh, I'm, I'm online. Nice okay. to meet you, uh, Bernard. Thank you. Yeah, great. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I'm very happy to be here with you all uh, today, this morning. And also thank you, Nathan, for the kind invitation. Uh, today, we're going to look at the theme of worldviews, uh, which I believe, you know, has a lot of relevance for our lives, uh, particularly during this time and age of multiculturalism, uh, plurality of, uh, you know, religious traditions that are coming. Uh, to jump straight into the theme for today, let us look at the title. The title that I've given is there right in the screen. I hope you can see the PowerPoint. Uh, engaging worldviews, one world, single view, one world, different views, many worlds, many views. So although the main title is engaging worldviews, to which we will get at at some point, a fun way probably for us this just one second. Uh, Daniel, if you can just mute yourself uh, and then unmute when you want to speak. Uh, yeah, thanks. Okay. Uh, probably a fun way of entering into this session would be to find out what is your worldview about worldviews? What is your worldview about worldviews? So take a look at those three things. Uh, I've given you three options. What do you think? Uh, how do you understand this? One world, single view. One world, different views. Many worlds, many views. Go on, give it a try. Yeah, I think... Uh, what, uh, what this statement brings about is basically, at least how, how it appeals to me, Mm -hmm. uh, more about uh, a whole perspective a person might have thinking about uh, whether this world is, uh, or basically this is all that we have, one world, one view, or, you know, if, if currently this is the world that we are living in and there are multiple other worlds that you're looking at, or if we are a part of multiple worlds and a perspective in that multiple worlds. If right. Great. Thank you. So which one would you choose if you were given an... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's interesting. I'm between the third, second and the third, actually. Okay. I, I'm not too sure. <laughs> which one. Thank uh, you. Put my feet in. I, I think the third one. Okay. Great. Uh, okay. The only reason I tend to the third one is when, because Jesus said, you know, the kingdom of God is already here. So <laughs> probably I'll have to give it a thought. <laughs> cool. Anyone else want to give it a try? <laughs> There's one world and the, yeah, go on, sorry. Yeah, I would certainly say, I mean, the first one, one world, one view is, I mean, we're just surrounded by so much, uh, so many different views. So that certainly kind of uh, uh, things, again, the definition of world. So we live also in many different worlds. Nice. So uh, yeah, between the second and third, like Nile, I would say, right, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, I, I mean, it's very interesting. Actually, each of these positions has, is part of a very dominant philosophical position that has been historically developed over many centuries. I mean, today what we are saying is very interesting. A uh, hundred years back, nobody would have thought about it in that way. Everybody, till the 19th century largely, believed in one world and a single view. And that single view was the, the truth about, about the world, as it were. It's only today that, it, and it's become common speak in a sense, where we're thinking that, well, yes, it appears there's one sun and one earth and, uh, uh, you know, everything around us. And, but there's multiple views. That's a view that began with Nietzsche. In some sense, it's called perspectivalism, 
The first one came from Descartes, where there's an objective world, one world, and there are, uh, you know, there's one way of understanding truth. But uh, we are more and more inclined towards thinking of world as many worlds, and there are many views. Uh, the world itself is different. So anyway, to, uh, for today's talk, there was just a teaser to get us into the subject as it were. Today, is, this is not a Bible study. It's not also an academic class. But I would like to look at it as an exploratory session where we learn together uh, with regard to the worldviews. You know, when we think of the term worldview, there are three dominant areas or domains that come into play. And I, I really liked the values of the Colson Center that kind of, kind of captures that in terms of values. Um, I would say the first thing about worldview is we must know our worldview. We may think that just because we have a view of the world, that we, we know our worldview. And, and often that's a mistake. Uh, most of us sitting in the pews on a Sunday morning or living out, living out a certain tradition are not completely aware of the, 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 not just the finer points, but even some of the pillars of the, the view that we hold about the world. So knowing one's worldview, and I think that's kind of the focus of the Colson Center, the Christian worldview, you know, knowing the Christian worldview. And I think that's absolutely essential in today's day of pluralism. Secondly, uh, if at all we have any uh, inclination or direction towards mission, then we have to understand the other or the other's worldview. So, and, and today it's not a simplistic, uh, I, I mean, the, the classic uh, example is right in the scripture, isn't it? Like when Philip got caught up to go run up to the Ethiopian in his chariot and the Ethiopian is reading and he says, and Philip says, do you understand? He says, no, how am I, until someone teaches me, how am I supposed to know what this means? Who is it talking about? And I want to reverse that for us. And if I were to suddenly ask you, do you know what your Hindu neighbor believes in? You know, the answer should be no. How am I supposed to know unless someone teaches me? And if our calling is towards our you know, neighbors to do uh, the work of the kingdom, then understanding the other's worldview is so important. And finally, living together. I think that's a life of mission, the kingdom life. Uh, there's a dialogical seeking after the truth where we, just like what Philip did to the Ethiopian, he pulls him alongside, explains to him, and together, there's a synergy there. It's not one versus the other. It's not one going for another's head. It's not the Ethiopian walking away saying, you know, I don't get it. But there's a, there's a living together that comes about because of this seeking after truth. So Colson Center's three uh, lovely values, which I find right at the top of your website, is clarity, confidence, and courage. Clarity, I would say, of one's own worldview. Confidence in understanding the other's worldview and courage to live together, courage to live together. So I thought that beautifully fit into uh, the kind of uh, work that we want to explore this morning. But when we think of worldviews, there are three problems immediately. We're not going into them. Uh, that would be another day. Um, but just a quick uh, thing to you know, kind of give us the background to it. There's an epistemological problem. How do we know what we know? Because a worldview is a view of the world. So how do we get a view of the world? Uh, is there one view of the world we talked about? Is there, how can there be many views about the same world? Uh, is there just one world? Secondly, there's an ontological problem, the ambiguity of the world itself. And today, that's again, it's common speak that we all inhabit various worlds. We all understand the idea of a laptop, and yet it's not a universal phenomenon because my laptop is kind of an extension of my world, which would mean nothing. You wouldn't even have access to my laptop, as it were. The same as I wouldn't have an access to yours. And what your laptop does for you, no other laptop could do that for you. So, so it's your own world uh, uh, within which the things, the objects, the people move around. And, and, and that's very different from another person's world. And thirdly, there's a linguistic problem as well in terms of how we describe the words. Um, I'm just going to do a couple of fun things, the first and second, we won't even touch the third. But this is just for us to understand uh, the epistemological problem. You know this uh, definitely, uh, wouldn't you? I mean, what picture is this? Yeah, so Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So when you look at it, what is it that you really see? What captures your immediate attention? Yeah. 
Christ. Okay, great. But when you look at this picture, particular picture, what captures your immediate attention? Yes, of course, Christ, who is at the center of the image. So the 12 disciples around the table, they're talking to each other. <laughs> right. Because I studied it, you also know they're asking who, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, okay, Nathan, I didn't get that. So uh, basically, each one is asking. Jesus said, "Someone's going to betray me, right?" I see. Uh, okay. So each of them is asking uh, the other. You know, who is he talking about? Is it thing? And then they're signaling. One signals to John, who's closest to Jesus, to say, "You know, ask him." Ask him. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that's the oh, that's no. the moment that's actually captured in this. Oh, I, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. 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 Just saying, yeah. Amazing, amazing, isn't it? See, yeah. We'll come to that. Um, but my my introduction to this picture came from a very different path and probably in a different setting you could identify with that uh, i got introduced to this painting through the writings of dan brown <laughs> the da vinci code uh, i don't know if you heard of it and and, and this, this this painting plays a huge uh, role in his plot he's a fic you know he's yeah, a fiction yeah. writer let's keep him as a fiction writer he's a great fiction writer i mean that that's what it is i mean he's writing fiction historical fiction but the, the, the thing that he points out about this picture is that he's talking about uh, he's talking about the person on Jesus's right. He's talking about the person on Jesus's right. And he asks the question, is that a male or a female? So every time I look at this painting, that's the first question that comes to my mind. I look at it to see, is this uh, a male or a female? Who is it? Look at the hair, look at the shape of the face, look at there's no uh, facial hair, etc, etc. Now, we talked, Nathan talked about the theological significance, the, the biblical backstory. I've given you a story about uh, Dan Brown's fiction that has driven me to look at it in a certain way. And if you actually look at it in, in a sense of a um, uh, uh, as a student of art, you would find that this is Leonardo's most impressive work, The Last Supper. It's a masterpiece of the High Renaissance, and it is a combination of perfect formal design and dramatic characterization. And they, they're kind of grouped in his typical pyramid shaped uh, arrangements. And also, he gives, uh, he intensifies, look at the shade between, it's a 2D, it's a two dimensional painting. And yet it gives you a certain depth because of the Cariascaro style of painting as well as uh, uh, which contrasts light and shadow and gives it certain perspective. Now, a student of art who will be studying high Renaissance art, when, when he or she looks at that painting, would look at it through that lens. And we could look at it through a biblical lens. We could look at it through a fiction lens. So I only see what I already know. The painting is common to us, and yet my view of the world shapes even what I see. You know, all of those are there. You know, there's nothing which is not there. Of course, look at the fingers. They are asking, go find out who is it going to betray. That's there. It's very much captured in that. And look at the lady or the man or the figure on Jesus' right. That's also captured there as well as the Karyaskaro, the light and the shadow perspectives. It's also, they're all there, but we see what is determined by our worldview, the, our dominant worldview as it were. So that's the epistemological problem. What is it that we really know? How do we know what we know? Now there's also an ontological problem uh, between us and this again you might be aware of it if some of you have seen it it's uh, have you ever encountered this image yeah it's called the what what do you see what is it that you see on the screen <laughs> i know what it's called but it's a duck and a, or a rabbit right it's, it's what, yeah, what do you see <laughs> It depends how close I am to the image, I guess. <laughs> if I'm closer, I see a duck. If I'm far away, I see a rabbit. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Sorry, Daniel. So, uh, at first, it looks like a duck. And then, uh, when uh, Niall said rabbit, then it looked so uh, like a rabbit. So, it was just uh, bias then came into play. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And also, you know, today in YouTube, there's stuff like 
there are things that you can't, you, some people hear one word, and other people hear another word of the same sound. You must have seen it. It, 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 was, it was doing the rounds in social media. I mean, our senses, there's ambiguity about what we consider as objective world or things. For example, what is this? It's a duck rabbit in a sense. So um, is this really, you know, is this really, a, uh, you know, is it really a rabbit? Is it really a duck? There is so much multi-layeredness in reality itself. There is so much mystery in the world that and our two eyes can only, our senses can only capture so much. You know, we know about light, you know, we can see or we can hear only to a certain frequency. There is so much that we can't even see and there's so much that we can't even hear. And, and so it's not just a matter of what we can see and hear, but the world itself is multi-layered. There's an ontological problem that the mystery of our world, which we call natural world, is not simplistic, this is, is mysterious. And then, of course, when we talk about uh, the way we represent it in language, it has its own uh, problems. We will not get into that today. But so the, the, the worldview about our worldview is it, it, really problematic. It's not easy to come with an answer. Is it really one world or is it layered? Is it a duck rabbit? Is it different views? Like we talked about the biblical view of uh, the Last Supper versus the Dan Brown view versus the art critics view. Or actually, are there really many worlds? And, and many people have different views. Therefore, in order to know someone else of another worldview, I need to actually enter into their world. And, and technical language here is, the first one would be called objectivism, the second would be more towards relativism, and the third would be hermeneutical knowledge. And in some sense, we are in the third ballpark today uh, in terms of our way of thinking. The world is moving towards that, to understand that people really, really experience, not just view, but experience worlds which are different from ours. And, and therefore, we need to enter into them. Okay, so to, um, uh, just a quick personal story now. Like um, my area of specialization is philosophy of religion. Um, and I studied Sri Aurobindo's integral philosophy that enabled me to actually get, uh, uh, you know, get into uh, understanding the Hindu worldview. And uh, it gave me an opportunity to explore it. And my previous studies in the seminary helped me to, of course, understand my own Christian worldview. However, I feel that my primary calling is to reach out to the Hindus who have a completely different worldview. Therefore, my interest also lies in what's called as dialogical hermeneutics, uh, which gives me uh, tools, as it were, to, to understand the others in their own terms. And, and actually to not just understand, but engage with them authentically, respectfully, and yet ask the tough questions about truth yet ask the tough questions, and there are ways to do that. So today we live in such a world of political correctness that everything goes, right? You can't really question any form of life because if you do that, you come across as politically incorrect. But I think uh, that that's not, that need not be the case. Uh, so it is not the number, the second view, one world and many views. It's all my opinion. It's just like, no, no. There are games with their own rules of engagement. And when we talk about football, there's certain knowledge about football that governs that conversation. So we can ask about tough questions, about truth, whatever we talk about, but there's a way to get into it. And very interestingly, in my own life, uh, formerly, I was a research fellow at the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies, while at the same time, simultaneously, being a research tutor at the Oxford Center for Mission Studies. So it's straddling two worlds, as it were. And uh, my second book that I'm on is Rethinking Christian Mission to the Hindus. Uh, why I say that is because this whole understanding of worldviews or different traditions and how they engage with each other is central to my own thinking and also, I believe, my calling. And uh, therefore, it's a pleasure to you know, kind of explore that this morning. Um, I believe that although every believer is called to witness the love and the gospel of Jesus, it is not everyone's calling to do serious cross-cultural or inter-religious mission work. Let's be honest about it. Let's be straightforward about it. Not if, and it's all right. That's what it is. We all have to share the love of Jesus wherever we are in the marketplace, amongst our neighbors. But that doesn't mean all of us are called for specialized cross-cultural mission. Uh, we find that in the Bible, James, the brother of Jesus, the leader of the Jerusalem church, John the apostle, and many of most of Jesus' disciples, they were primarily called to the Jews. And even as they gave leadership to the church in Jerusalem, 
Jesus himself, when he talked to the Syrophoenician woman, said, look, woman, I've been called for the children of Israel. I'm not called for the Greeks and the Gentiles. I'm not. So, you know, there, there is something about that calling which I want to bring about. Because sometimes you hear all this and you start to feel, oh my gosh, I'm not in that zone. Am I ineffective? You know, why am I not able to talk fluently with Muslims and Hindus and atheists? No, no, no. We've got to understand our calling. And it's not going on a guilt trip. You know, wherever, whatever God has called us to, that's what we've got to be faithful to. And this is not everyone's calling in one sense of the word. But in the same book of Acts, we find that Peter, uh, uh, he was an exception. And uh, particularly we see, and Paul, of course, was called to the Gentiles. Yeah? His calling itself was to the Gentiles. Um, and this sort of a biblical basis is important. The book of Acts is fantastic. It gives testimony to the beginning of cross-cultural missions. In chapter 7 to 15, I think that for me is, and of course it extends to chapter 17, where uh, Paul stands and gives a great uh, speech at Athens. Uh, so the, 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 that, that's a beautiful uh, section of the New Testament. In chapter 7, we find the martyrdom of Stephen, and from 8 onwards, the birth of cross-cultural missions. Philip in Samaria, with the Ethiopian eunuch in chapter 8, call of Paul in chapter 9, and then comes Peter and Cornelius, chapter 10. I actually have a whole session on that, which I love because I call it uh, slightly different. I call that as the conversion of Peter, conversion of Peter. That's where it all began. You know, Peter was the rock on which the church was to be established. But if he himself was going to call the rest of the world unclean, where was the church to go? And that was a pivotal moment in the history of the church that God had to really do something and break into his worldview. And after that, the bigger breakthrough came in chapter 15, where we see Jewish Christianity, the first century Jewish Christianity, converting to receive Gentiles. You know, it's a great story. I love that story because their problem of missions was radically opposite to that of ours. They had all these Gentiles who wanted to be Christians, and they were saying, no, no, become Jews first. Become Jews. Go get circumcised. In our time, we have nobody come. We are like pleading with people, please follow Jesus. Please come to Jesus. And they were having everyone knocking on the doors. We want to follow Jesus. And the Jewish Christians, the early church, didn't know how to handle them because they were Jews. And they had to learn the kingdom value of how to receive the other. It's, it's, it's an amazing journey of the church. But today we live already in a highly multicultural society. And cross-cultural mission is right at our doorsteps. So although maybe your personal calling is not towards this, but still you cannot avoid it because we are right in that zone. It's at our, our neighbor is someone else. Someone at our work, our colleague belongs to someone else. We don't live in a ghetto of you know, Christians any longer as it were. So all believers it's to some extent need to be equipped in cross-cultural missions. And it is in this reference that the conversation on worldviews um, gets important. It becomes important precisely because of this. So the big question is, how do we understand people having a different worldview? How do we understand people uh, having a different worldview? The, world, the word worldview actually came into being for the first time it was used in 1790 by one of the philosophical greats of Western uh, philosophical tradition, uh, Immanuel Kant. And he uses the word wealth and schwang. And that means worldview. Actually, he just used it once to talk about an intuitive view of the world. But that word gets picked up. And later on, there's a whole history of how that word has been developed. But for our um, uh, per, uh, perusal this morning, let's look at a quote from G.K. Chesterton. You know, someone closer to our view and someone who, who's written on the, the word, uh, on, the term, uh, on the term of worldviews. He writes, and I quote, in, in his book, Heretics, uh, which is found in the complete works of G.K. Chesterton, quote, this is what he says, but there are some people nevertheless, and I'm one of them, who think that the most practical and important thing about a man is still his view of the universe. We think that for a landlady considering a lodger, it is important to know his income but still more important to know his philosophy. We think that for a general about to fight an enemy, it is important to know the enemy's numbers, but still more 
important to know the enemy's philosophy. We think the question is not whether the theory of the cosmos affects matters, but whether in the long run, anything else affects them. Anything else affects them. So there are three insights as it were from Chesterton. Uh, the first thing is the most important thing about humans is their view of the universe or the worldview. Secondly, in his language, as you can see it, the view of the universe for him is the same as philosophy. In other words, a person's philosophy or worldview affects all matters of his life. All matters of his life. All humans are philosophers, in a sense. That is, we all have a view of the world. And we need not be scared of the term philosophy. You know, today our world and our, the way we live in it, the word philosophy means something esoteric, something in an ivory tower, a very complicated forms of thinking. No, our view of the world is our philosophy of life. You know, and whether we are conscious or unconscious about it, we live out that philosophy every day. It can be simply defined philosophy is thinking about thinking. It's reflection. How do I think? Why do I think this about this? Why do I value this over this? In other words, how do we think about anything? And therefore, worldviews are important because here's the clinch. They, that is the worldviews, dictate or inform the way we think about everything else in the world. Our worldview informs and directs us about how we think about everything else in the world. So our worldview is important. Okay, uh, we already talked about uh, the biblical basis. Uh, okay, right, sorry that I moved forward. The, quickly, a few common definitions of worldviews, just for us to, you know, just get into this, the language that's used. You know, G.K. Chesterton, we already looked at it, a view of the universe and theory of the cosmos. There's a guy called James Orr. He says the whole manner of conceiving the world and humanity's place in it, the widest possible view which the mind can take things, a life system rooted in the fundamental principle from which was derived a whole complex of ruling ideas and conceptions about reality. And Francis Schaeffer, a perspective on life, a whole system of thought that answers the questions presented by the reality of existence and a comprehensive framework of one's basic beliefs about things. That's Albert Walters. Uh, and there are a few others who have given some, uh, Norman Geisler, and I've got a few others who talk about what the world is and uh, what the worldview is and how to understand a worldview. Um, I like this uh, by uh, Mark Runko. Uh, he, he writes something like this, that a worldview is a broad perspective on life and the universe. It is indicative of a person's philosophy, although the distinction between philosophy and worldview is a bit fuzzy. It may be easier to relate the latter to your own life. You may not think that you hold some formal philosophy, but very likely, if asked, you could say a few things about your worldview, what you expect out of life and your assumptions about the world. What you expect about life, your assumptions about the world. So there is a personal touch about worldviews. We need to understand how worldview works. Even if you want to converse with another person, we cannot uh, assume that the other person thinks and envisions the world the way we do. Personally, they could be thinking very differently than us. Everyone has a different take on the world and their worlds itself could be quite different from ours. Um, now, there is a story in BBC that I read about, the story of Horace Capron, because we want to move slightly away from just the personal worldview to see how, what role does religion and tradition and culture plays in the understanding of worldview. So the story of Horace Capron, he was, he's the one first person to travel through Hokkaido in Japan in 1871. And he searched for a sign of human life amongst the vast prairies, wooded glades and threatening black mountains. And he writes actually in his diary, how amazing it is that this rich and beautiful country the property of one of the oldest and most densely populated nations of the world should have remained so long unoccupied and almost as unknown as the African desert. This was Japan's frontier, its own version of the American Wild West. The northernmost of America, Japan's islands, Hokkaido, was remote with a stormy sea separating it from Honshu 
Travelers daring to make the crossing would have then had to endure the notoriously brutal winters, rugged volcanic landscape, and savage wildlife. And so the Japanese government had largely left it to the indigenous Ainu people who survived through hunting and fishing. Few people living in Hokkaido today have ever needed to conquer the wilderness themselves. And yet, and this is the clinch, uh, psychologists are finding that the frontier spirit still touches the way the people in Hokkaido think, feel, and reason compared with the people living in Honshu just 33 miles away. They are more individualistic, prouder of success, more ambitious for personal growth, and less connected to the people around them. In fact, when comparing countries, this cognitive profile is closer to America than the rest of Japan. So um, what are they trying to really say? That social environments mold our minds. So it's not just my personal uh, you know, choices and beliefs that I make, uh, but there is something about history, geography, and culture can change how we all think in subtle and surprising ways, right down to our visual perception. Our thinking may have been shaped by the kinds of crops our ancestors used to form. Therefore, our worldview is personal to only some extent. In the sense, we may have a preference of coffee over tea or Jesus over Krishna. But these options that are available to us belong to long historical traditions. Therefore, in a sense, our worldview is shaped by the dominant traditions to which we belong. This is where religion comes into the picture. All of us belong to religious traditions, and dominantly, it is these traditions that shape our worldview. You see, our religious uh, you know, uh, adherence, our religious uh, piety, and our religious allegiance have very, are very strongly connected to how we view the world, which in turn reflects everything else that we do in the world. And yet we live in a world age of multiple belonging. Okay, so today, even as we think about this, I want to find out how much more I can get into it and how much more, because this is a good foundation to talk about worldviews. And I'm wondering how much more time, Nathan, we would have so that we can um, get into it and at what level I can. Mm. Yeah, so, Bernard, I mean, we... Uh... We total time we had was an hour because I know Daniels also has work, etc. But uh, the point was also we wanted time for questions, and I think uh, uh, Niall was also ask, sending me on the chat, you know, as to whether you know there would be time for questions. Right. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, if you want to take a few more minutes to kind of you know, as you okay. feel comfortable, but then let's allow 15 20 minutes for a question. Okay, perfect. I think that's great. Okay, so, um, so when you that's how, so it, when we say that the worldview is not just about our personal view of the world, it is also dictated, like we said, by our social environments, history, geography, culture, and religion. Then we are talking in terms about Eastern worldview and Western worldview. You see, that's how we come to it. The East thinks differently from the West. So right at the bottom of this uh, the slide, people in the West tend to be more individualist and people from Asian countries like India, Japan, and China tend to be more collectivist. I mean, again, that's not necessarily true of everyone in India because India too has a plurality of worldviews. Okay, now I want to come very directly to what I call as the elements of a worldview. Uh, and probably that, that, and I got a couple of uh, slides uh, and I think I'm, I'm mainly coming to the close of it if you don't drag it. Uh, I want to uh, you know, submit before you seven um, elements or constituents or components of a worldview. When you think of worldview, think always of a historical community. It is not an individual worldview. And that's been where I've taken us. We all have our individual view of the world, but that belongs to a larger community of practitioners to which we belong. And today we belong to multiple communities. So I want to you know, submit before us, if you talk about Indian Christians, we dominantly belong to three different uh, worldviews. And, and we don't have the time to develop that idea, but just to state it. We're all Christians, and again, which brand of Christianity is something we need to find out, right? And then there's nothing right wrong about it. You know, I could be Catholic, I could be Orthodox, I could be Protestant, but within Protestant, I could be a Presbyterian, I could be a Baptist, I could be an Anglican, I could be an Evangelical, I could be a Pentecostal, and all of them have a tweak on the worldview. 
all of it, they're not the same world. I mean, an evangelical church, the one I grew up in, and the charismatic church I pastored in, at one point in time, they're completely different phenomenon. They come, not just the values, the practices and everything. It's, it's very, very different. The way of life or life itself was ordered differently. So the community plays an important role in determining what kind of um, uh, worldview we have. Secondly, the narratives, the stories that are told. They build our worldview. You know, which myths and stories are we uh, told about? Thirdly, the key texts, sacred texts or otherwise, because I also believe in the secular worldview, they have their own scriptural sacred texts. So every tradition, every worldview has its own text. Fourthly, practices, the kind of practices that we do, the habits that we're given, the rituals that we partake of. Fifthly, our view of transcendence, our view of... Uh, the other worldly, as it were, whatever it is, we call it God, or we call it differently. Number six, tell us of life. You know, where is life all headed to? And finally, a, a certain logic that holds this world together. A certain logic. How, and then again, you know, millennial, post-millennial, uh, so the dispensationalist versus this, all of that hinges. Maybe they have the same data, but the logic that holds the view of the world could be different. So this is, is, the, is the briefest <laughs> talk about the components of a worldview, but you get the overview of it, hopefully. And that, that's how a worldview is formed. So worldview is not just about my opinion versus your opinion. It, it, it goes a whole lot deeper to the traditions that we inhabit. Um, there is, I, I had something about key features of a Hindu worldview. And uh, perhaps, and, and it is just going to touch it. Uh, I'm not going to even, you know, even for today, I plan not to go deep into it. That's another story altogether. But, you know, A, is there a Hinduism or Hinduisms? Uh, and there are, there are materialistic worldview, uh, like Charvakas, who are extinct now. They were in the early centuries uh, of AD. Um, they were completely materialistic, like today's atheism uh, or humanism in some extent. Uh, they had no concept of God or even Buddhism as an offshoot of Brahminical Hinduism, doesn't have a concept of God. On the other hand, you've got very, very strongly Bhakti-oriented uh, Hindu traditions, like the Vaishnavas, and to some extent the Shaivites as well, and the Bhakti traditions. The Guru traditions are there today. I mean, the Patanjali's of our days, and the Vedantins, the Advaitins, who, who are philosophically tuned, but all of them are Hindus. All of them are Hindus. So is there a Hinduism or Hinduisms? There are multiple worldviews. There's a diversity of worldviews within the Eastern so-called worldview. Secondly, the understanding of time. You know, as Christians, for kind of a Judeo-Christian worldview on time is linear. It's, it's appointed for man to, to live and then die. You know, we have a very clear path of you're dead and gone. But theirs is a cyclic, you know, yuga. There are four yugs that make cycle, you know, is, the math of it is complicated um, and, and everyone says or believes that we are in Kali Yuga, that means the Yuga of complete destruction. The Satya Yuga was 100% good, Kali Yuga is 100% bad, Tritra Yuga, the second Yuga is actually one third bad, uh, Dwapara Yuga is 50-50% bad, bad, and Kali Yuga is completely bad. And, and Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Yuga after Yuga, every Yuga, when we go into destruction, when we go into complete uh, sinfulness and evil, I come to destroy evil and to save. So, so there is something which is quite different. So that's why Hindus, they're more relaxed. And sometimes you could even say they're very complacent about life. They're a little passive, you know, because they, they, what's happening is not, uh, this is not the end of the story for them, you know. Death is not the end of the story. Life goes on. So there's this doctrine of karma, the cycle of rebirths. Again, sacred texts or scriptures, they don't have one sacred, like the Bible, Different traditions have different scriptures, uh, as different texts as the scriptures, completely different. They've got these four views, uh, four uh, pillars of their worldview, as Purushartha, the four goals, the four aims of life. Artha means wealth, the economic welfare, Kama is pleasure, Dharma is duty, and Moksha as uh, delivery from the cycle of rebirths and oneness with Brahman. Um, and, and then dharma, what does dharma mean? Very different, it's not ethics, it's not equal to the Christian idea of ethics at all. Dharma is to do one's duty according to one's position in society and according to one's uh, uh, status in their lifespan. Uh, so the life is divided into four parts, 
four ashramas, and as you know, the Varnas are four. So we can go a lot deep into it at some other time, but they have a completely different perception of life. It's a completely different perception of society, completely different perception of ethics. So we cannot suddenly go and say, you are a sinner and Jesus has come to save you or trying to do mission. It doesn't make any sense. And we are talking across each other. And finally, we even talk about God. They don't have the notion of a Judeo-Christian personal God. They have an ultimate notion. It's a Brahman who is Sachitananda in a sense. He's consciousness primarily more than a person. So, so it, this is again a very brief uh, crash uh, um, summary of uh, a Hindu worldview. But each of this can be expanded to see. And these are some of the things that are common to um, most of the traditions or offshoots uh, of Hindu of the Hindu traditions. Uh, this is my last slide, really. Um, uh, engaging a different worldview. I don't want to go into it deeply again, but probably just to cover that. In order, and this is from my old book. In a sense, this is something I'm developing. It's called Dialogical Hermeneutics. You begin with incommensurability. That means you begin, you've got to begin by saying, I don't know the other person. I don't know. You know often it's easy to say, ah, I understand, I get it. And then we start to re uh, think of them in our perspective. Right? We start to reduce them to our thought. That's the problem. So begin by saying, I don't know. Secondly, you've got to imagine them. That means you've got to learn, you've got to listen. Thirdly, you've got to not just imagination, inhabit them. This is where I love Paul in Acts 17. He walks into the city, goes into the temple, right up to the altar to read the inscriptions, reads the stuff, inhabits that world so that you could talk out of that. He could be one of them. He, could, he would say, you, you are very religious people. I applaud you. You actually have an altar here to the unknown God. And guess what? What you have there, which is unknown to you, is what I'm bringing to you. I mean, that level of inhabitation is, is today in many of our circles, we would, even, we would even consider it as sin. We wouldn't even allow that kind of inhabitation. And number four, interrogate. See, once you have inhabited, then comes the time for interrogation. Then you can interrogate truth. Not, we often, unfortunately, sometimes evangelical, we begin with interrogation. What do you believe? Oh, you're a lie. That's false. I have the truth. You're going to hell. I'm going to heaven. And the conversation doesn't even start. There is a place to interrogate truth claims, but it comes much later in the game. It doesn't begin. It comes later. And finally, if there's a relationship that's formed through this process, there's an integration, there's a coming together. And, 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 and you know, there will be an Indian Christianity. In the second book that I'm writing, this is my last slide, really. Um, there's a guy called Yaroslav Pelikan. He's a Catholic thinker, a philosopher, fantastic guy. He's written uh, that the, what the New Testament has been taken to mean in the last 20 centuries in different geographic and cultural settings. He argues in the introduction that it will become evident in great and perhaps even confusing detail before this history of images of Jesus through the centuries is finished that it is not sameness, but kaleidoscopic variety that is its most conspicuous feature. He brings Schwarzer to support this claim. And this is the quote which I want us to kind of end and focus on. Each successive epoch found its own thoughts in Jesus, which was indeed the only way in which it could make him live. And that each epoch typically created him, that is Jesus, in accordance with one's own character. And he kind of goes through the church history to 2,000 years. He talks about the Jewish Jesus, the Greek Jesus, the Greco-Roman Jesus, then the Catholic Jesus, then the Renaissance, the Reformation Jesus, then the modern Jesus. You know, he goes through the whole thing. And unfortunately, there is no Indian Jesus in this story. There is no Indian Jesus. And I think that's where the engaging of worldviews is important. Engaging with the Eastern worldview, engaging with the Hindu worldview. Because when that integration happens, I believe we would have a conception of Jesus, a reception, of, a, an image of Jesus, which would be real, true to the biblical account, and yet palatable, acceptable in the language of the worldview amongst whom we live. Thank you for this opportunity. And, uh, Thanks, Bernard. Thanks so much. Thank you. So, uh, Thanks. Uh, Thanks, Bernard. Thanks, man. <laughs> yeah, it was quite interesting. I have some questions, though. Sure, uh, please, please. Uh, 
Uh, I, I like the point about, uh, um, I'll start with the, the latest one that you said, you know, where you said each uh, epoch of time creates its own representation of, of Jesus. But uh, I was just thinking about this. Uh, mm. uh, uh, do we have to be careful also in the, uh, in a sense of, uh, uh, does he mean actually that uh, the way we present Jesus might be different based on the times, based on the culture, and based on, upon the people that we're speaking of, keeping the, the truth about him firm? Or does he mean that, you know, even based on the times, you, 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 the truth also be able? I don't think that's what he means, right? Okay, so that, that's the whole, it goes back to our title, One World, <laughs> you, know, yeah. uh, you know, in a sense of, uh, you know, one perspective or many, what, what, what does it mean? So, I mean, what he is, in a sense, the way I understand or the way I interpret him is that we always see Jesus through our lens, through our worldview. <clears throat> so the, the Jews could, you know, the Jews had, a, you know, the Jews couldn't, I mean, how do I put it? Uh, the early Jews, the, the early Jewish church, it was impossible for them to look at the divinity of Jesus or Trinity. The Jews believe, I mean, there, what is the first commandment? There is one God, Yahweh. They couldn't imagine everything else would be idolatry. So for the, there was a very big issue, right? And, and that was something which the Jewish church in the first century struggled with. But the moment it went into the Greek uh, conceptual world, Trinity came up in the second century, actually, in church history. And it came up quite well because you could talk about the one and the many. And there were concepts which would allow us to talk in that language. It's only in the fourth century that Trinity was kind of affirmed in the Nicene Creed and, you know, we, we, that's part of church history. So what it means is our vision itself is conditioned by our worldview. The historical event, in a sense, is there. But how do we understand it? How do we understand it? So when we say truth, like we look at the, uh, 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 you know, uh, Leonardo's picture, and what Nathan said about, you know, the biblical backstory is true. What Dan Brown fictitiously, though, points out, there is something there. I mean, he's not, you know, you know he's not talking out of his hat. And of course, the art critic is talking about the pyramid structure and the karyaskaro that is there. All are true. So if someone says there's an aeroplane there, now that would be false, right? I mean, if someone says that, look, you can see a pub there in the center of the picture, that would be false because our understanding of pub is not that. But what, but what is, is there the truth? Or are there many interpretations of the truth? Or are there many words? And in a sense, Jesus, so the, the problem with our previous epoch of modernity was that they went to the first thing, one world and one view. And, and so, when you bring that and start dumping it around the world, it becomes very, very difficult. So, because it becomes alien, people don't know, can't relate to it. But then the, there was, in the West itself, there was a fight against called modernity and relativism. Oh, every view is valid. And again, that leads to hopelessness, nihilism. So I think this, this critical engagement, this dialogue, so a Hindu will discover Jesus as he engages with Jesus being a Hindu, no other way. And, and in that engagement, he understands Jesus, like Sadhu Sundar Singh, for example. And, and that is something that would work. So the truth of Jesus is the same, absolutely the same. And yet how he's understood is determined by different cultures, different worldviews. So, uh, I mean, this goes back to the, uh, the three problems you, you mentioned about the worldview, right? The ontological, the epistemological, and the linguistic. So this right. is more uh, with the epistemological problem, is it? Good and, point. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> nice. So in, in a sense, in a sense, I mean, I, I'm just trying to, I, I'll tell you why, uh, the, the reason why I'm asking the question right. is my thoughts are, uh, if I have to, uh, if I'm speaking to a person, like usually we have a discussion at the office yeah. about these different traditions yeah. and stuff like this. Uh, there's, there's all, I mean, I, I, I personally am careful, even though, you know, when we look at different uh, perspectives of the Hindu tradition, uh, you see the Christian worldview fit in certain areas. You know, there is a sense of overlap, not entirely. In the peripherals, there is the overlap. 
but uh, you know I, I'm usually careful and this comes back to the inhabitation point that you brought you know of how much of that if I take inside to the other world you present Jesus from the Eastern mind how much of the Christian truth do I compromise so what do you know you know I, I'm a little bit careful there and so if you could just probably sure, guide sure. And, and I'll tell you there are no uh, strict laws and rules on that uh, at that point of dialogue between, because um, because our view of we, we already said you know we are not holding to the notion that uh, uh, there is one view which now we have to translate. See that's what we are trying to do. Then there's a problem because now people come up and say there's a Hindu Jesus in a sense of like there's a black Jesus, right? We talk about black Jesus. We talk about a Latino Jesus. I mean in the liberation times we have there's a feminist Jesus. Jesus is a female actually. I mean, I, I find some of these ridiculous because they don't really stay, uh, stay true to the biblical account of who Jesus is. Jesus is a Palestinian, bottom line, as he, in that incarnational sense, in that historical sense. But that event, that story, how does a Hindu perceive that story? What aspects of that event is he going to pick out to make sense within his worldview? That's what we're talking about. Even what he picks out, you know, even within the Christian uh, traditions, the, 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 the Western church picked up on sin and salvation, the cross. The Eastern church picked up on resurrection and the deification uh, uh, process of the, human, of the human body itself. So in a sense, there is a difference even within our own denominations, which part of the cake we are looking at, in a sense. So, it's, see, so for someone to say Krishna is Christ, for me, that's, if I can say it, you know, that's rubbish. If Krishna is not Christ. Or Christ is not Krishna, can't be. They're completely different characters belonging to different historical traditions. So we are not trying to uh, bring it together. But we are talking about a creative dialogue between traditions that affirms the difference and yet tries to learn together and ask these critical questions. Yeah, but see, for, for the Hindu, it makes complete sense to say Krishna is a form of Christ. No, right? he can't. No, no, even the Hindu will not be able to say that. For, for an, uh, so basically, when I, uh, when I dialogue with them, uh, usually what they come up with is, he's an avatar, basically. Even Christ is an, is an avatar of you know, either Brahma or one of those. No, so this is, I'm uh, sorry, sorry to cut in, but no, the, thing, no, no, I like, yeah. the, the problem there is modern day Hindus don't even know their Hinduism too well. That's a huh. reality though. Because Krishna is an avatar of Vishnu, Correct. Shiva has his own avatars. So she, the Shaivites, you know, <laughs> take the Vaishnavites out. If, you, if, you, if they try and collate or, you know, say that yeah. Krishna is the same as Shiva, no way, it can't be. So even within the Hindu broader tradition, there are particularities. I mean, today it, it's kind of, we are in a post-colonial age, you know, Hinduism, in the, the general understanding is quite shallow. But if you go to the Mats, or if you go to the real, uh, uh, you know, like the Nim uh, Nambodri Brahmins of Kerala, for example, who are following the traditions of old, oh, they're very, very specific about what they believe as opposed to what someone else who's another Hindu believes. So even within them, there used to be great argumentations and fights and debates about, you know, is it Shiva or Vishnu or, you know, things like yeah. that. So, so, so they won't, but in the broader view of Brahman, that at the end of the day, which is kind of common to, uh, to, this, to the Hindu worldview, that at the end of the day, there is this one universal consciousness, which is beyond all particular manifestations. And, and therefore, Christ is also one of the manifestations of that Brahman, as it were. Or not just Christ, you and me as well, the table and the laptop as well. Um, and, and that, uh, I mean... Uh, I mean, in the sense, the way to interpret that as well. I mean, uh, in that way, yes, the Hindu could say that the Hindu has no problem with Jesus. I've been saying it all my life. Hindus have absolutely no problem with Jesus. Yeah. So you know? how do you get there? So because uh, uh, what I've seen with my friends is uh, they have no problem in a common sense and, uh, you know, keeping a picture of Jesus along with uh, their other deities. Yeah. Because that's, that's their worldview. It's the, one of us are, it's the exclusivity that becomes the problem, right? So. 
Yes, exclusivity that becomes a problem. And, and here, I, uh, we had this, uh, the, the RZIM Eastern Worldview meeting that we had last year. I was in the last panel and somebody asked the very same question. And my response was slightly different. And for a moment, it was like, what? And then later, uh, I say, let the picture in. <laughs> Why are you looking for harvest before you have begun to pull out the weeds? You know, I think there is this, you know, McDonaldization of mission. We expect to share the gospel in three minutes and the fourth minute, uh, we need a convert. I think that's, uh, it's, it's unbiblical. Actually, Paul says very clearly, the one who plants may not be the same one as the one who harvests. And the timeline of that journey, God alone has it. It's not our job. You and I cannot harvest anything. It's the harvest of the Holy Spirit. So is the planting. So is the whole process. So my point is, if you are able to bring Christ or his picture or whatever way they find appropriate into his house, wonderful. I think that's first base. Let's not be worried about exclusivity before we even introduce before, you know, even in, I think in dating language, they have now, I'm dating, and then they move to an exclusive dating. In the US, they have this parlance now. So in a sense, we are immediately talking about, you know, tying the knots, even before they know anything about Jesus. Why are we so obsessed? You know, I think that's quite a, uh, it's a negative approach, according to me. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, what's the right word to say? It, it, it's, it, it's a leftover baggage of the enlightenment paradigm of the single world, single view, one world, one view, one truth, everything else is false. So my way or the highway, my truth or the highway. But I think we've moved away from that. You know, Hindus are sophisticated. So I think if they are willing to bring Jesus into their homes, I think the angels would begin rejoicing right there. That's the first step. That's not the last step. And I can tell you stories about this. Part of my work among Hindus in Delhi, there was this government official very high up in CPWD and he retired. And he was a Hindu and uh, he had an interest in Jesus because he went to a particular church where he had a problem with one of his sons. They prayed and he got healed. And so that's it. So once a month, we used to have a house church in his house. He'll bring his entire kandan. There'll be 30, 40 people literally. And my gosh, the worship there was greater than any worship I held on a Sunday morning. Everyone's weeping and crying and all Hindus praying together. Then I'll share something. And then when it's all finished, the men will gather around and everyone's sharing stories. My job was just to regulate. I was too young. I made lots of mistakes. I was just holding firmly to make sure Jesus doesn't get compromised. But in the but it was a place where from the Gita people would talk. They would talk from the place of uh, uh, all sorts of uh, backgrounds. And, and you know, they'll discuss the women or somewhere else. Then we would have a big dinner and we'll finish the evening. For a year it went on. The house is full of idols. Actually, in my own worldview, I, I look at them as pieces of art. I didn't even think of it, to be very honest. Forget about telling him. But he was aware of it, that his house was full of idols. And we had just finished a meeting on a particular Thursday. And we had to wait for, uh, we had to wait for one more um, you know, month to do it. But within 10 days, there was a call to the whole group. Please come. And uh, we were like, why is it out of time? He just called us. It's about a year, year and a half. And then when we were there in his house, he was wearing all white, kurta pyjama. His family were all dressed in white. And then he shared the story. He said, we've been doing this meeting for over a year, about a year and a half now. And none of you guys ever told me about the idols I had kept in my house. None of you even pointed it out. Last week, Jesus told me to do something. He said, I've come to live here now and I think it's time for the rest to go. But they are my kandani. You know, it's called Ishta Devata. Kulla Devata, Ishta Devata. What do I do with them? So one day I took all of them, nicely wrapped it up. I drove four hours to my village, which is outskirts of Delhi in Haryana. I dug, went to my village, dug a thing and I buried them. And I came back. This house now belongs 100% to Jesus. Nobody had told him. And nobody had asked him. And often this is the work of the Holy Spirit. You know, I can't do it. If I had rushed him, he would have been antagonistic. And he would
Thanks, Bernard. Thank you. I have a couple of more questions, but I think so. I just want to be sensitive to your time. So yeah, yeah. we can put it on the chat group, uh, you know, and uh, I, I can email you. Yeah. I shared, and I'm sure we'll ask. Uh, yeah, Bernard's okay with it. We'll uh, we need to ask him to do another one to really sort of do a bit more deep dive on what he just sort of came up to the end, particularly on the in the side as well, right? So yeah, because I think uh, that you know we're not going to get through the questions in. Uh, yeah. So yeah. So uh, so Brainard, if you are at some time, if you're okay with that, yeah. Any, so, anytime, yeah, anytime. Yeah. Sure. So we'd love that yeah. to happen. But thanks so much. Uh, thank you for time and all the effort that you put in to uh, prepare for this. I mean, uh, it was wow. Very honestly. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. Uh, Nair, would you just close us out in a word of prayer? Thanks. So much. Sure. Uh, Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this beautiful time that you have arranged for each one of us. I thank you for the ministry and for the work that you have assigned and the openings that you're giving, Brenat, especially in the Eastern culture. Dear Lord, uh, would you help to shape the church to each one of us into, into the same perspectives to produce your truth out here, your truth of life. The life that you have given us, that is of grace and of mercy that you have extended to each one of us, Lord. Would you give us the privilege, to, uh, the land that you have blessed us and, and, and placed us in, to be representatives, ambassadors of this light, of this grace, of the sons of God that you have called us to. Uh, and Lord, would you help us to extend your truth in this land, Lord. However, uh, however, Best, the best way, Lord, that you choose for each one of us. I thank you, Lord, even right now of challenging our thoughts, our preconceptions, our, uh, our beliefs, and, and the platforms that we stand on in order to approach such a culture. But Lord, would you keep challenging them? Would you bring, bring to the surface all of the assumptions that we hold so dear? And would you burn them with fire, test them with fire, dear Lord, and only let the truth survive, Lord. We, we recognize that you have been so gracious, gracious and merciful to each one of us in our lives. Why not, Lord, we extend this mercy to the world around us? Why not we extend this grace to the world around us? And I thank you, Lord, for times like this, where we can uh, talk with each other, we can challenge each other on thoughts and ideas, and we can learn from each other. And I thank you for the time that you bring the church together through these meetings, Lord. Even the virus cannot hold the church back. And I thank you for your grace and your strength through this. Lord, we pray that each one of our purposes in our lives are fulfilled, that we stay on the path that you have kept us on and we continue whatever be the circumstances around us till one day, Lord, you come again and renew entirely what there is. In your name, Jesus, we make this prayer. Amen. 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 Amen.